Welcome back to Media Law. And last week we looked at the uh, open justice principle. And this week we're going to look at some areas that infringe upon open justice. We're into module 2B and we're looking at contempt of court restrictions and reporting the courts, which are the basis of uh, chapters 5 and 6 of your textbook. So when you read that textbook thoroughly, you'll learn that contempt of court is a large area of the law to do with uh, any behaviour that interferes in some way with the administration of justice. Now, there are several of these areas of behaviour that might interfere with the administration of justice, and they stem back for many centuries. In fact, some of them from the earliest days uh, relate to the courts trying to establish their presence in the community. And the textbook explains that there were travelling courts way back in the early days in, in England, and really the courts needed what we call summary powers, powers of punishment there and then uh, to perhaps take control of a village and ensure that villagers were actually uh, following uh, the rule of law and uh, obeying the judge's directions and the fairly harsh penalties. Someone that disobeyed or misbehaved in the courtroom in that situation might have um, lost their hand or um, have actually been killed uh, because of their disobedience uh, or misbehaviour of the court. The five main areas of contempt though that concern journalists and this important area of media law, uh, are the topic of what we call sub judice contempt, uh, which is Latin and uh, it relates to the area of prejudicial publicity, material that is published in the media that might impact in some way upon an upcoming or a trial while in progress. Scandalising the court, which is really... Um, insulting the court system or, or the judge in some way that really erodes the public uh, confidence in, in the court system. Um, revealing the deliberations of jurors is another area of contempt and clearly uh, jurors are, are meant to be kept uh, anonymous in our system and their deliberations in the jury room are meant to be confidential and uh, for somebody to go out and reveal what happened in that courtroom is seen as a contempt in its own right. Uh, there's an area called contempt in the face of the court and that kind of contempt relates to misbehaviour in the courtroom. And it's amazing how often we do find magistrates or judges uh, charging somebody with contempt in the face of the court because they've done something wrong, perhaps insulting, in there in the courtroom, uh, which has disturbed the court proceedings, perhaps stood up and yelled something or uh, used their phone when that has been banned in the courtroom or something similar. And the final area uh, of great concern to journalists and uh, sometimes to public relations practitioners who might be dealing with journalists is the area of disobedience contempt. And disobedience contempt is where uh, the court has directed somebody to do something, perhaps to answer a question in the courtroom, and the person has refused to, to follow that court's direction. They've disobeyed the court order. And this can be a formal order of the court, perhaps to appear, uh, to answer a question, to stay away from somebody. Uh, that can constitute disobedience contempt if you don't do that. Um, but for journalists and their sources, who might be a public relations practitioner or even perhaps a lawyer, um, disobedience contempt arises when journalists under their ethical code are refusing to answer a question which might identify a confidential source or refusing to give the court information or documents or computer files that they fear might identify their confidential sources. So they are the key areas of contempt. Uh, this time, in, in, this, in this chapter, we mainly focus on sub judice contempt. The others are discussed a little, 
and disobedience contempt is covered much later in a module and in a chapter when we're looking at uh, secrecy and confidentiality of sources. So what is subjudice? Uh, subjudice comes from the Latin meaning uh, under a judge or under justice. And subjudice contempt starts, as, as one judge famously said, when the fountain of justice has begun to flow, when the fountain of justice has started to flow. Now, in criminal matters, that point has been decided to be at the point, the very moment at which someone is arrested or charged with a crime. For journalists and for lawyers, sometimes it's difficult to know whether someone has been formally arrested or charged and whether the sub period has started. And we just debate that point a little in the text. We also debate the difference between what might be called a technical contempt, where you might have published something that might breach sub judice rules, but not one that you might actually be charged with or pursued over. And it's very hard to tell when something is just technical or not. But uh, prosecutors and the courts are more likely to press charges for contempt where a series of factors come into play. Typically, it's if your outlet or your publication is reaching a relatively broad, a wide, a large audience, and that audience is, is within the area where witnesses of the crime might be affected or where jurors might be selected from. And it also is more likely to happen the closer you get to the actual crime itself. Now, all of that said, we don't want our journalists uh, getting into trouble for contempt of court or even being warned about it in the courtroom. So you need to look very closely in the chapter at the key red flag areas that are mentioned. And the big ones are identification, showing the visual, uh, particularly the facial features of an accused person um, uh, once they have been arrested or charged. Um, if identification is going to be an issue that witnesses will have to attest to in the trial. And sometimes it's hard to know whether that will happen. Um, so we err on the side of caution and typically use uh, extended pixelation or black uh, um, disguise marks to show the accused once that sub judice period has started. The other big areas are anything you publish or quoting people uh, prejudging the guilt or innocence of the individual. Um, also things to, go, to do with someone's prior convictions or criminal record or serious uh, matters to do with their character. So um, these are things uh, that might uh, influence or adversely affect either witnesses or jurors in the case. And the final big thing is witness testimony that you might gather through sources or through quotations that goes to the heart of the case and matters that are going to have to be determined in the courtroom. And uh, once that sub judice period has started, uh, journalists need to avoid interviewing uh, sources about what might or might not have happened um, if, if that person is likely to be a witness or their, their comments relate to something that might be contested in the courtroom. So what it comes down to is um, whether what you publish, and this might apply to social media, uh, mainstream media, um, but it would normally require a reasonably large audience. Remember in social media things can go viral very, very quickly. So your Facebook following, for example, might just be a few friends, but if you start publishing something about a notorious court case, uh, your followers or friends might go through the ceiling and you would come within the domain of contempt of court. But what you publish would need to have a real and definite tendency 
to interfere with the administration of justice, in other words, to prejudice the trial. Now, the courts aren't as concerned as to whether your material might prejudice or um, embarrass a, a judge or a magistrate. Um, so the preliminary proceedings, while it can still apply, are less a concern than the actual lead up to the trial itself, the major trial in a criminal matter uh, on what is called an indictable offence when a jury is being impanelled. So that, that's the main thing to watch for there, uh, anything that might impact upon jurors or witnesses in serious criminal matters. There are some defences available, thankfully, and uh, because the principle of open justice uh, dictates that we should be able to report openly upon these things as much as possible. And you do find differences between, say, Australia and America in what can be covered in the lead up to an important trial. In America, it's much more open under First Amendment protections. In Australia, it's much more closed and we are much more limited in what we can say in the lead up to a uh, notorious case. So the defence, the main defence that's available to journalists is that if you write or uh, present a fair and accurate report of what is actually stated in open court in the presence of the jury and you do that within a timely man manner uh, fairly soon after the particular proceedings and you don't recycle material from preliminary proceedings that might have been prejudicial later on the eve of the trial, then that fair and accurate report defence should apply to you. And the second defence, which, the public, um, which is the public interest defence, is much more controversial and much, more harder to sustain, much harder to sustain. And that's where we look uh, particularly at the Hinch case from 1986, where the broadcaster uh, and more recently um, senator and politician Darren Hinch uh, actually went to jail for contempt of court and was unable to convince the court that um, his broadcast about an accused child molester on, on, major, on a major Melbourne radio station was in the public interest uh, when he prejudged this accused person's um, guilt and mentioned several of his previous offences in those broadcasts. The main thing that you need to remember is to refer to that time zone chart that appears in the textbook. Many journalists throughout Australia actually have that very time zone chart photocopied out of the textbook and sitting beside their desks so they can see where they are in the criminal process and get some indication of what it might be safe to report in the lead up to a major trial. There are digital dimensions to this that are mentioned in the textbook as well. And unfortunately, journalists now are up against a lot of discussion, which is actually prejudicial on social media. But because the mainstream media reaches such a broader audience than your ordinary social media user, Journalists can't say as much about one of these upcoming trials as people are saying out there on social media, which can be very, very frustrating, but it's the safer way to approach it. The second big area uh, relates to the chapter six of your text on court reporting restrictions. Uh, the textbook talks about why we cover court, and there are many reasons. I actually mentioned some of those reasons uh, last week when we were looking at open justice, so I won't go into them again, but suffice it to say there are important social reasons, uh, deter deterring people from committing crimes, but also media audience-driven reasons because um, crime is an interesting thing for the public and it's relatively easy uh, to send someone to court to gather that news. There are privileges that journalists have that ordinary members of the public don't. And they do vary a little between different courts and different states, territories and jurisdictions. But the basic ones journalists will normally get is that they will normally get access to a cause list or a list of the proceedings uh, that are happening in court that day. Uh, 
they'll be able to at least see if they're not even if they're not actually given the documentation on the basic charges uh, which contain the spelling of the parties' names and the key the key people that are appearing in court. They are allowed to take notes in court, uh, which is interesting. I've often taken journalism students to court who are not working journalists and the magistrate has asked why these people are taking notes because it's actually a, a privilege that attaches to journalists, working journalists, rather than other members of the public. And sometimes journalists have special privileges to be able to actually record the court proceedings, uh, not for broadcast purposes and normally with the permission of the court and in some places to be able to tweet from court. So you can see that journalists get these special privileges. Uh, most courtrooms actually have a special bench, a press bench available for journalists to sit there to report, another privilege. And another is that in the biggest, most notorious cases, the public is often restricted from actually going into the room because there isn't enough seating available, uh, but journalists are normally given a priority in those circumstances. The textbook talks about the main things that need to be in a court story, the main ingredients for a court story. Now Griffith University students normally do their court reporting as part of another course. So we won't go into that in great detail today, but um, if you wanted to try your hand at writing a court report on some basic facts by visiting the courtroom, I'm sure your tutor would be happy to have a quick look at that story to let you know whether you're on track with that. One of the most important aspects of court reporting, though, are the restrictions that journalists face on certain matters that are before the court. And this is something you really need to uh, read and understand, and it feeds into your learning problems throughout the semester. And the textbook gives much more detail on the restrictions in particular jurisdictions to do with offences related to juveniles or children, sexual offences which vary in their restrictions between states and territories, um, family court restrictions which are extensive. Essentially you pretty much can't identify anybody who is the subject of family court proceedings. Restrictions to do with guardianship uh, matters, uh, prisoners, once they've actually be become part of the system and their parole applications and identities. Um, mental health matters are often anonymised or sometimes public access is restricted with the courts closed. National security issues often have uh, quite strong restrictions attached to them. And preliminary proceedings, bail applications, uh, sometimes these matters are restricted in some parts of Australia. Tasmania has very strong restrictions on bail hearings. Now, apart from all of that, the courts also have the power to issue suppression orders, uh, to close the court for parts of proceedings, and you're normally not allowed to report on material that is discussed between lawyers and the uh, judiciary uh, when the jury is not present. Often they are debating or discussing matters of law or matters that they do not want the jury to hear and uh, the media are not allowed to report upon any of these things um, unless the jury is present. And that also applies to questions that might be withdrawn as part of the court processes. So you can see reporting court um, is a fine art. It's something that needs some training and practice and uh, you'll normally be mentored by a more experienced journalist. It's something that lawyers will often be engaged to advise upon and so uh, it's very important that if you are ever going to report upon court or try your hand on it, uh, try your hand at it, that you are um, across those restrictions. It is also important for your learning problem. May I remind you, remind you again of your study plan where you just view this little mini lecture as just one part of the many learning activities. So please go off and uh, read the chapter, consider it in the context of your learning problem and uh, engage in the other learning activities. And we'll see you next time.